Doniger, board member of the, on the Humboldt County Historical Society, and we'd like to welcome you to today's um, after Saturday speaker series. We have a monthly free lecture series that's co-sponsored by the Humboldt County Library, the Humboldt County Historical Society, and the Clark Museum, where we are now. And we're happy to have live in person and our Zoom audience at the same time. So I would hope that uh, all of you um, are members of any, each and every society, every arts organization in town. We could really use your support. We thank you. And today we're really happy to have um, a speaker who is actually on the Historical Society Board. Hopefully he'll be vice president soon. This is Mark Castro, co-director of the Cultural Resources Facility at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, he's an expert in cultural resource management with a master's degree from Sonoma State University and has over a decade of experience in the field of California archaeology and heritage management. Um, he, his uh, project uh, currently involved, uh, he's currently involved in a project entitled Filling the Gaps, the Untold History of Latino and Portuguese People in California's Most Northerly Counties. This project pr promises to unveil previously hidden aspects of California's history and culture. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jasmine, who's the registrar of the Clark Museum here. <laughs> Jasmine. Hi, uh, my name's Jasmine. I'm the Nealis Hall Registrar Curator, and so Nealis Hall is where we're at right now. Um, and so I just wanted to let you guys know that if you stick around, we've got exhibits um, going on in the main hall and in Nealis Hall. They are new as of September, so if you haven't seen them since September, you should check it out. Um, you should also hang around because at 5.30, Arts Alive will be starting, but we're also going to be celebrating Archaeology Day with Cal Poly Humboldt, um, and they've sponsored us for free admission, so we will be offering activities and demonstrations until 9 o'clock tonight. Um, and then again, we'd just like to thank the Humboldt County Historical Society and the Humboldt County Library for their partnership. Um, and stick around and check out the exhibits, but also keep an eye on our social media for upcoming events for the winter, including Winter Wonderland. Oh, I have a last thank you to our sponsors. <laughs> the Cutting Edge Salon and Carl Johnson's make this monthly series possible. So thank you for that. Okay. Mark, I'll give it over to you. Okay. I think it went off. Yes. Can you hear me on the... Hello? Hello? This one, this one's fine. Okay, I'll try to speak up, and if I need to, I'll use the microphone. But I prefer not to if I don't have to. Um, yeah. So just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, as I said, Arts Live is tonight. Um, Humboldt County Historical Society is doing the voting for the new board and uh, officers. So please come down to uh, the Vance Hotel, where La Familia Coffee is, from six to eight to do the uh, voting there. As well, we are also doing the 2024 um, launch of the calendar. Uh, here is a sneak preview of what it looks like. Here's the cover with a bunch of aerial photos, history over Humboldt. And there is just a quick snippet of, you know, uh, what some of the photos are. So just a lot of cool photos from all over Humboldt County. Perfect, okay, so, yes, as they said, I'm Mark Castro. Um, I've been uh, thinking about this research and how did it all start, right? COVID, all just doing work or lack of work, honestly, being on the computer. Uh, my normal job is doing archaeology reports and trying to do research on different properties. And as I go along, you find sometimes something interesting. Um, as I was going along, I don't even remember the project I was doing. I was reading uh, Lowell Benin and Jerry Rohde's book, traveling the Trinity Highway, where I came upon this photo, um, which just said Mexican packers with their loaded mule train in Blue Lake. And it was like, okay, that's, that's interesting, because I just always assumed, um, having been a student and living here for many years, that I just never knew that there were people here earlier than maybe the university. Um, and even with my research doing a lot of on the gold rush and stuff like that, it just, the demographics are very, very, low and just understanding of who was here um, other than like the Chinese which is gets a lot of a lot of interest so um, this kind of started me on this overall project as uh, Susan stated which was to look into who was here as a Latino since the start um, of the Spanish exploring the coastline until about uh, 1960 
um, both in Humboldt County, Trinity County, Siskiyou, and Del Norte County. So this will just this presentation will just focus on Humboldt County. Um, so as I said, the, the project will explore the early Spanish exploration period from 1500s and then kind of ending about the National Bracero uh, program that was about 1964 and when the start of the U.S. Census Bureau started actually reporting people as Latino rather than white um, or some other categories as you'll see in some of the um, records. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of like I said, the, the, the project was mostly uh, started to understand is this a, fail, uh, a failure in historians or um, to show that history or am I just you know, uninformed? Um, so, and as I said, it was during COVID, so trying to reach out to people was non-existent. Um, people just weren't at the office anymore. So you couldn't call the historical society, couldn't call any of the historical societies because no one was there. So I just had to keep going day in and day at night, in, at night and just kind of go through ancestry records and that's what this research is gonna show. Um, so starting off with uh, the Spanish explorations of Humboldt Coast and the larger Western Coast. Um, the first being uh, Captain Cermeno um, in November 4th, 1590. Um, he went up the coast, um, but he did not stop in Humboldt. Um, or at uh, what you'll see later at Trinidad. Um, there are a lot of exploration and ships that were going and bringing goods from China uh, to Mexico and the other colonies in the Spanish Empire. Uh, California at the time, Alta California, was um, just uh, you know more of a backwater place that um, slowly became more populated. And this region, especially, um, you know, didn't have the missions, didn't have all the presidios. Um, they really just barely touched Humboldt and that was it. It was just more of a map that they claimed it. Um, the next kind of uh, big Spanish uh, exploration that came through uh, was the Spanish captains of Heceta and Bodega Quadra, um, which they came to what is now uh, present day Trinidad Bay or uh, the Baroque village of Ch uh, Churay. Um, and that was in June 11th, 1775. And at that point, that, that meeting um, was when uh, the Franciscan friar took a group of the crew. Uh, they went to the head, or as close to the head of Trinidad, and um, erected the oak cross and had the inscription claiming the land for King Charles III of Spain. Uh, an alleged piece of the of cross is over at the Trinidad Museum, um, so if you want to go view that. And then this map just kind of shows at the very top where the star's at, that is, you can't really read it right now, but it, that says Trinidad. So that's, this is a map from 1784 where they are trying to map the coastline. Um, and this is where it's actually showing a coastline rather than California as an island, um, as they did uh, prior to that. And I just really like this image from some of my past presentations. It's just kind of one of the first representations and drawings of Trinidad itself. Um, and you can kind of see one of the ships there and then uh, some of the Yurok buildings at the bottom and then some of the houses. So this is 1851, so much later, but like I said, it's just kind of a closer representation than photos would do to show you kind of what it probably would have looked like back then. So that period um, happens and then yours a big, um, lull in people of either Spanish descent or um, what would become Latinos, right? Mixed um, race individuals. Uh, so the gold rush happens. We have the gold strike over near Sacramento, um, the Marshall strike at Sutter's Fort uh, and Mill, um, or Mill rather. And then uh, we have later strikes. As you see, there are multiple different gold fields. Um, the northern uh, gold fields over here in the Trinity, Klamath, Salmon, um, Smith, and all the, these kind of areas up here um, was a little slower, um, but not by much. Um, you have James Abrams, who um, found gold on the south fork of the Salmon River, and I know uh, Redding uh, found it over there um, on the Trinity River. So I said very shortly after those, and that's kind of what brought people from the, those lower gold fields that were very lucrative up to um, the northern gold fields. So, 
again, another thing to show, you know, ethnic diversity that was in California. This is Su Chang's 2000 um, report on demographics of natural born uh, or uh, uh, non-native born or foreign born uh, peoples in California from 1850 to 1870. Uh, so you can just see the numbers um, where Mexicans in the beginning are pretty strong and then they kind of peter out a bit. Um, but as I said, the, the numbers for the northern regions up here are really not well known or it's, it's hidden somewhere in someone's document that I haven't been able to find. Um, and then I like this picture, it just kind of shows Mongolian miners, so right, so another you know, group that could be looked at as well, right? There's a lot of people from Hawaiians to Russians, um, everyone was here because of the gold. And then this map right here is one of the earliest representations of Humboldt County. Um, and if you can see that red line, that is from Trinidad going into um, almost probably more like Wichpec and Orleans where the miners were going. So this was the first trail, the Trinidad Trail, um, that um, led people over to um, people and goods to the gold fields from the coast. All right, so actual people. So um, here's, these are some of the names from the 1860 uh, census um, showing some of the first la known Latinos, not to say the first Latinos, because we don't know there could still be people. It's a lot of the early documents, because um, census is every 10 years, so the gold rush hit, you know, and um, 1850 was a really poor year for documentation in the non-populated areas. Um, there are some records, but um, like I said, we just didn't see those people, and they may have come in on an off year and then disappeared, you know, came in for the one year or two and then didn't strike anything and left. Um, but these are the, the, those that were actually documented in any kind of form from that period. So uh, you got, uh, it says railroad packer, I think it's supposed to say, you know, trail packer, but I kept what was on the record. Um, and then uh, farm labor, uh, stock raiser, and other laborers, as you see there. Um, of note in the middle, uh, let me see if I can pronounce the guy's name right. Casause Agustico um, and Francisco Marquez, those were both laborers at the Henry, uh, Henry or Hank Larrabee Ranch. So, and Larrabee is definitely a name that most people in the history circles know. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so they were uh, farmers or laborers on that ranch. And um, to my knowledge, they kind of were on the census and then they disappear, like a lot of these people. Um, and it's kind of hard to keep corroborating who's who and names and stuff like that because they'll pop in for like one census or one document and then they'll disappear. Um, but the majority of people that were in, that were Latinos in the area um, are um, people that did the pack trails. So the packers uh, taking mule trains, like I said, from the coast, from what was then in the beginning Union, now is Arcata and Trinidad and moving that stuff across the land uh, to Orleans, um, into the deep Salmon River, um, stuff like that. Um, here are some of the known uh, Chilean packers are Domingo and Gregorio, and then also, um, actually that should say Mexican, but that's Sacramento. But there is also documentation that says that he may have been Chilean. There's kind of a little bit of discrepancy between um, where he was born. Uh, the photo here shows some of the packers. It's kind of a well-known photo. Um, it's in a lot of uh, documents with the historical, histo uh, from in the Humboldt Historian. So people have done research on the pack trains. And there's been a couple articles in the newspaper recently that have shown this photo. Um, the only one being Ben Billy um, of Wichbeck towards the top upper left that um, is not uh, either. Uh, uh. So I'm gonna focus on Sacramento uh, Moreno. Um, so he was kind of a bigger player. He ended up partnering with Alexander Brizard's mercantile business uh, for a short period. Uh, more specifically with the packing part of the business. Um, the business, to my knowledge, was temporarily known as the Brizard Moreno Company. Um, 
And like I said, he was described as both Mexican in some instances, and sometimes he was Chilean. So, but more so, I saw Mexican. So I'm going to assume he's Mexican rather than Chilean. Um, and he um, at times packed supplies to uh, companies, uh, the company branch stores throughout the Klamath and Trinity from the 1870s and 1880s, uh, which would be uh, Willow Creek, Wichpec, and Orleans were some of the branch stores that were out there. And then they had, at one point, a 70 mule pack train, um, yeah, in 1875 is what it was stated. And this is just, like, this is a later picture, I think from the early 1900s, that just kind of shows what kind of pack trains would kind of look like so that uh, you guys can see that. Um, couldn't find a picture, unfortunately, of him, um, but, and I really tried, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, he was one that pops in for one census and then he disappears. Um, however, um, based off uh, Zuz Susie Van Kirk's work, and she did a document um, on Arcata and historical buildings and the history of Arcata, um, this house right here across from New World Water actually allegedly is, is called the Packer's House because of him, um, and it allegedly was his house. There's also a little bit of discrepancy on whether or not um, it may have been an earlier house and it was someone else, you know, someone else. But, um, but at the moment, uh, this uh, house at 630 11th Street in Arcata, um, until we say otherwise or find otherwise, is uh, Sacramento Moreno's house. So that's kind of cool. So you can kind of, you know, you can go to that house right now and be um, at places that Latinos are there. Another person of note is Domino, uh, Domingo uh, Babancos. Uh, he was a well known packer and later mail carrier. Um, he was born in Chile in August 1831. And um, if I remember correctly, he first was in Chile and then was a soldier for a short period of time when Chile and Peru were, uh, were having a war. And then after that left because of that, um, that unrest um, and then came to the US and to Humboldt County. Uh, he at times would worked for Alexander Brizard, Horace Gasky, over in uh, Del Norte County. And I couldn't get his first name, but uh, Kohlberg um, out of Arcata. Isaac. 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 Okay. Um, but yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, worked for all these major players, um, like I said, and was at times the uh, lead packer. So he had a lot of responsibility to make sure that that stuff moved across the landscape. Um, as I said, later years, he was a mail carrier um, in uh, the 19, uh, 1900 census for the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation. He uh, was noted as a mail carrier. And to my knowledge and kind of guess is Bell uh, Soktish, I believe is how it's spelt. Um, like I said, a lot of these documents, it's hard to know what the correct spelling is, um, was likely his wife um, at one point, and they had two children, uh, Juanita and Augustine. Uh, yeah, and then, um, so here's a quick story just about kind of his character, I think, and his um, kind of work ethic. Uh, while working with Gasky, um, he was asked to take um, a $1,500 uh, $1, to cover a debt. And I don't, it never stated where exactly, but maybe it was Happy Camp, because that was another store that Horace had. Um, but it stated that heavy rains and the Klamath River at the flood stage kept the canoe man from coming across for Babancos as he was trying during these heavy rains to get to where he was going. And so he tried the money, so he tied the money to his head, tied his hat over it, and then urged his horse to keep going through the <laughs> raging current. When the horse began to swim, he slid off and he grabbed onto the horse's tail, but he did successfully take the debt on time. So, <laughs> so um, like I said, he was definitely one of those uh, probably in an earlier time would have been called a mountain man because he was in those mountains and he was very skilled at what he did. And a lot of these uh, packers um, were very skilled. And then this, I like this picture just because it shows, you know, crossing the river. <laughs> very similar probably to what he was doing, but in a very nicer time. Um, here is his daughter, Juanita. Uh, she, uh, she, a lot of the stories that we have about him come from her. Um, she was born in Hoopa in 1882, um, shortly after their mother died. And like I said, it, there, she's never named in any of the stories or doc, you know, articles that she um, stated. Um, 
I just found that reference in, in one of the census records. Um, but uh, so she was uh, separated from her brother, Augustine. I believe he was taken to one of the re-education schools for Native peoples as the, at the, as the time was. Um, she was a homemaker. Um, within her life, she married two men, uh, John Charlie, another mail carrier, which would make sense, right? He's in the same industry as her dad. Um, but he died prior to 1920, and then she remarried Joseph Gray. And then she spoke with Betty Allen and wrote an excellent, uh, which there's an excellent article about her father um, in The Humble Historian. So she often rode on trails with her father as a young girl, and she recalled that the mules had names, and each one had a saddle made just to fit. The mules from habit would line up beside the load by themselves. Uh, some were noted for being good to top uh, pack animals and two men would travel on foot with them to prop the load while they rested. So, yeah. It's a nice little story about like, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at all the data, but it's nice to actually hear stories about these individuals. Let's see. Oh, that's where I was gonna be. Okay, I, I took that slide out. So, um, before we move on, I wanted to see if there was any questions before I went on about this uh, kind of period, this kind of the pre-1900 period, and then we're going to be kind of moving slowly into the 1900 period. So, if anybody had any quick questions. I mean, also, Paige, there were Argentine packers, too. Are you mm -hmm. going to talk about that as well? Yeah, yeah. And some people I didn't also include were, um, I had to make sure if I was calling them Latino that they weren't just born in one of these countries, like some of the Brizard family, as they moved to Peru and Chile, they were born there, but I wouldn't necessarily call them Latino because they were French originally. So I had to kind of parse out where I felt that. But yes, there, is, um, so, there are some um, unnamed, but um, and then like I said, Peru as well as and stuff like that. They probably all kind of, and the way that this country split up once at that time too was vastly different. So. Um, it wouldn't be surprising that Argentinian um, people were here as well. I, w I was interested in whether the Andean heritage had anything to do with their affinity for mule train packing in the mountains here. Yeah, I can't remember. I know, same like with, um, in the early gold rush period, like, and that's one thing I kind of, uh, kind of glossed over was the people in the Pacific and the people in Mexico and in South America were actually some of the first people to get here after gold was found because the news happened there first. So people were on the ships, they went straight to the Hawaii, went straight to the Philippines, stuff like that. They went straight to Peru, to Chile, um, and Mexico, and, and other parts of California as well. But so those people came in first a lot of the times. And then um, if I go back, I don't know if I still have it on that slide. Right, so the part of when these people came in and they were they had earlier gold rush periods in their like in China and in Mexico so when they came over they already had those skills so same with the Argent, you know South Americans as well had those skills as packers to um, and brought just brought that over to California and of course the, ge the geography of Chile is very similar to the geography mm -hmm. of California exactly so but yeah and then like I said at the at very early on, it's kind of interesting how, you know, like I said, on all our records, if, you know, if you didn't know better, um, Latinos and Mexicans were considered white. Like, so that's, that's usually what it's documented as. But in reality, right, uh, Mexicans, because they were doing so well, uh, that's one of the reasons why this foreign miners tax it gets implemented in California very quickly in 1850. Um, even though they're, you know, in some cases, you know, they were Californios. They, they were, they were, you know, citizens that got, you know, were U.S. citizens at that time. Um, and they were still charged because of the way they looked. So, um, but that's because they did very well. And people that came over in some cases um, learned those skills. And then that's when they were like, okay, now we don't need you to be here anymore. We have what we need. Um, and so, like I said, that's for that. Anybody have any other quick questions? Okay, cool. Okay. So. Cool. Okay. So this, like I said, there's a little bit of overlap on this specific one. Uh, obviously, Juanita is on this one. She was born slightly earlier than 1900. 
Um, but when we split it up, like I said, her period of time was more in 1900, so we just kind of moved those people over into that category. Um, so here are, I'm just gonna go through a couple slides of some of the different people um, that we have. Uh, these lists constitute about 80 names um, over a couple decades, and many of them are different families that came over. Uh, and I'm sure there are people that are just missing because they came through, like I said, and maybe it's just a different document. You know, it's not on a census every 10 years, or they didn't vote, you know, so there's not a voting rule that'll show them. So there are probably plenty of people that were here um, and just aren't just, are not documented, so, in any, in any case. So, but as you see, like I said, there is Juanita, you have uh, some Cubans later, um, for obvious reasons. Uh, some people with Guatemalan descent uh, later on, um, like I said, and they're kind of everywhere. Uh, Eureka, Trinidad, um, mill workers, laborers, woodsmen. Uh, let's see. What are they? These are these are censuses from 1880s all the way to 1960s. So, like I said, this is just a co you know uh, putting all together of all these documents, and then these. Um, pages were all kind of put together with one of my student interns. I'll do a shout out to Rowan Vespia. She, uh, they sat there for a long time uh, putting together a lot of the stuff that I said. I was up late at night just clicking next on Ancestry being like, okay, that's Mexican, that's not, you know, and stuff like that. So they put the madness together. So <laughs> they did the, you know. Um, so like I said, a, lo a lot of lumber, labor people, um, railroad workers in a couple cases. Yeah. But like I said, more of the main areas over here, Trinidad, Eureka, Arcata, um, but in some cases, Scotia pops up, right? And some of these other, other places, Blue Lake, um, right? Right, and it's not just men, right? There is women as well included in these lists. But, but are they land owners? Are they business owners? Are they mostly work? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, I would say probably when they first get here, there there's a lot of rumors or, or borders, right, in either hotels or at some of the company towns, right? And as we'll kind of describe in a little bit, uh, the company towns, um, especially the Hammond Lumber Company, uh, had a lot of people that came up here. Um, but yeah, so like I said, but a lot of times it just kind of depended, right? Maybe at the first couple of years they were here, they just were um, having a room out of a, a building, same like now, right? One person comes over and then the rest of the family comes over. Um, or in some cases, like the gold rush, it's just a kind of boom and bust cycle of a business, so, you know, industry, so they'll come in and then they'll leave once the season's over. And then here's, I think, one more after this, just to kind of show some of the diversity. Like I said, and it's over time, right? You kind of notice uh, earlier periods as woodsmen around the turn of the century, early, early uh, years or decades of the 1900s, and then you start getting Air Force as you get more into the 1950s and other yeah, uh, although you see the one from Puerto Rico, a uh, nurse, right? So like I said, so, and yeah. So yeah, so um, like I said, so switching industries, right? And that's kind of one reason why I chose to do the questions in the middle was just that we had the packing industry there, that period, gold rush, and now you're switching to lumber. That is the big impetus for a lot of um, ethnic groups to come into the area, Italians, you know, uh, other Europeans, like I said, just a lot of people came in for the lumber industry. And at that time, there was a lot of wood coming from the northwest coast of California and going down to all the major ports in Mexico. So that would explain why people were hearing, that. oh, there's jobs up there, right? Because um, it's like, why, why would you come, why would people from so far away come to somewhere, you know, so, at, you know, behind, behind the Redwood Curtain, right? With the, rather than like LA or some of these other areas, right? So that's always just been kind of like, what is the impetus to bring people up here? But it was the lumber industry. So in this case, these are some of the names from the Trinidad Lumber Camp from the 1930 census. 
Um, most of them did live there on site, like I said, at the at the company um, town and one as a border in one of the houses, uh, like at Falk or like at Samoa, right? Um, and then uh, the one uh, that I've highlighted, that's just the head of house, and then they lived in Eureka. So somehow they tra they they were the only ones on that list that just happened to travel up from Eureka rather than live in Trinidad. Hopefully that's not, no, okay, that's better up there. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so this, I'm not positive that this is the actual camp that they were noting in 1930, but this is one of the Hammond lumber camps that was near Trinidad. So this is Hammond camp number 21. Um, and like I said, it's about three miles east of Trinidad. So my assumption is if this isn't the camp, then this may have been what it looked like. Um, and in many cases, these lumber companies would take the buildings, put them on a train track, and then just move them to the next location with the wood. So, yeah. Okay, so now we're kind of moving into, so those are a bunch of names, like I said. It's kind of hard to go through. It's kind of nice data. Like I said, it's interesting, but it's nice to get the family stories, right? So um, the next couple uh, slides are gonna be more about two families. Um, so uh, this is the Cabrera Romero family. Um, so hopefully she's online from San Jose, but uh, Maria, who's pictured here, um, wrote this excellent uh, story about her family's um, history and, um, you know, and just described how her family came up to Humboldt County. Um, she uh, was born in Samoa. Uh, like I said, the family eventually moved to the Hammond uh, you know, mill over there in Samoa. And um, like I said, this book is available both at the Historical Society bookstore, but also there's a copy at the Cal Poly Humboldt Library as well. And the cool thing about the actual book, which I won't be able to get into everything, um, is that she also has um, kind of the musings of her dad. So some of his inner think, you know, inner thoughts, you know, that letters, um, proverbs that he really enjoyed. So it kind of, a little bit more of a different type of book. It's not meant to be a history book as much as just here's my family, so. So yeah, so here are her parents, Jose and Patrice uh, Romero. Um, there is their full name <laughs> as um, in Mexico, right? You have the names of your dad and your mom as part of your name. So <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, so she was born in uh, the state of Jalisco um, and, the, and he was born in Santa Maria de Los Angeles over there in Mexico. I don't remember what state it was. Uh, they, may, they met up here in Samoa. Um, not positive it was at the actual mill or it was just around um, as um, he came up here and then her family came up here. So that's how they uh, met. Uh, they were married on December 21st, 1929 at St. Bernard's Church in Eureka. Um, and then uh, their child was, like I said, Maria Patrice Romero. So she got very much the same name as her mother, very common in uh, Mexican families to just continue to use the same names. So, okay, so here are the two different families. So we have the Romero family. Um, so you got Maximiliano and his wife Maria. Uh, so, oh, it was both in the state of Jalisco is where they came from. Uh, they had seven children total, but the only ones that were named were Jose, Inez, and Maria. Um, the Maria, the, the mother, does pass away um, at some point early on. Um, and uh, Maximi, Maximiano, uh, he does remarry. Um, and that's one point Jose does leave home because of this and didn't want to be around that. And then he does come back and they do have a reconciliation, but um, he leaves for like the last time and does work and stuff like that around Mexico and the US in 1906. And his, with his dad's blessing, dad gives him money to help him on his way. And um, as far as I'm aware, he immigrated to the US in 1923. Um, and like I said, he did work a lot of different jobs. I didn't state them all here, but he um, worked from in Mexico and the US. And as was common at that time, 
he uh, kept crossing the border back and forth, back and forth for different jobs at different points, wherever the work was at. Um, and like I said, from my understanding, he arrived in 1923 to Humboldt County um, and to Samoa. And then so he worked at the Hammond Lumber Company mill um, in different tasks, as you do. Um, and then that's kind of where his story is at. So he came up alone. Um, none of his family, to my knowledge, but maybe later, uh, came to the to Humboldt County. Uh, the Cabrera family, on the other hand, um, so you have uh, Carino, Carino and Dominga. Uh, they have, again, seven children. Again, very common in Mexican families, <laughs> as my own, to have a lot of children. Um, so you have Maria, Patrice, Santos, um, Jesus, Josefina, Maria, Pachita. Um, following the death of the father, um, they all move, or it, it, some of them were older. Um, so the older boys were already had their own work and were not in the house. Uh, so only um, Maria, Patrice, and I think one of the brothers as well as uh, Dominga go to live with her sister, uh, Fermina in Guadalajara. And then um, it's not till um, her daughter, uh, Josefina, married Alvaro Toscano, who is one of the names that was listed in the previous slides. Um, they end up leaving Mexico because they're young, politics, he's not on the right side with the local politicians, and so they, leave and eventually make it to Humboldt County. Yeah, exactly, right? And then, um, so, let's see. Yeah, so Dominga came uh, to Humboldt County alone um, following a mill accident that kills Alvaro at the Hammond Mill uh, in 1922. Um, and then uh, once they get settled here, there really isn't anything more back in Mexico, so she brings the rest of the family up. Uh, some of the brothers, uh, or some of the sons, rather, of Dominga um, were already up in the U.S. doing work, both in Texas and Kansas, and then they just get the word, and like I said, they all congregate in Humboldt County. So they have a huge family here, uh, which is a good uh, community, right? And then here is a picture of young Maria and her grandma Dominga, and they're both at um, Josefina's house in, or Josefina's house in Samoa. Um, I couldn't at the moment track down exactly which house and where it was. I still am trying to figure out which house would have been there. Um, but um, like I said, and then uh, Josefina uh, ends up actually remarrying as well. Okay, so as I said, um, Jose Romero worked at the mill. So what did Patrice do? Um, and she actually ended up going from Maria Patrice to just Patrice is what they ended up just calling her. Um, so she actually ended up working at Dally's Beauty School when they first moved over. Um, I think she worked the elevator as well as a couple other jobs in the building and then eventually went on to own and operate her own business. Um, Oh, yeah, so Artistic Beauty Shop um, was later at N Street, um, but then there was another location earlier on. Um, and then here are some of the business cards and advertisements that she had. So that's kind of cool to see, like I said, like we have logging, we have all this stuff, but like I said, women were doing things, right? They are active and had agency. Um, so, and as such, um, both uh, were members of the community. Uh, Patrice was a member of the following clo uh, clubs from the Quota Club, uh, the Kennedy Institute, and the Catholic Daughters of America, right? Um, and as you see in here, she had, um, on the left, she was given an award and was very active in that club. Um, a lot of newspaper articles that show different events going on and that, and because she was so well-known and obviously so well-liked, on the right is when she was um, uh, her U.S. citizenship uh, test. So they actually gave her flowers and everyone was there to celebrate her becoming a U.S. citizen. But uh, Jose, or Joseph, as he later be called, right? Switching names from 
Spanish over to the English names. Uh, Joseph was a member of the Quarter Century Club at, at the Hamden's um, Knights of Columbus and uh, this other club with St. Bernard's Catholic Church. And then I believe you can see him over by the pastor over on the far right. Yeah. So like I said, they were, and they were like I said, they were active members of their community and you know, like I said, so it's kind of, not that people didn't know, it's just like, like I said, they're there. Um, it's just um, trying to get these stories out there, right? But it, like I said, it's just putting it all together. Um, the burgers. So uh, Frances Cabrera, so another Cabrera, right? Part of that family. She ended up marrying Ernest Berger on October 25th, um, a couple of years after I believe they um, both uh, immigrated or immigrated to the country. He came from Switzerland. She came from Guadalajara. Um, I believe she was 16 while he was 17. Um, and then they had four children, Robert, Arthur, John, and Thomas. And the reason I kind of chose them out of part of their family is that they owned uh, a business. So first, they, Francis was employed at the Daily Brothers store. Ernest worked for this grocery firm. And then they later purchased Frank Keith's grocery store at the cross streets of Harris and California streets in 1925 in Eureka, which they renamed to the neighborhood store that they ran and operated for about 50 years or longer. And then, as close as I can find from that direction, there's what the building looks like now. I know, very different, right? <laughs> and I kept trying to like switch off, but I was like, the other building on the other side just really doesn't have the same angle on the building. Exactly, and I kept looking, I was like, oh, well, no, it has the transmission line, it has all that, so. Um, and then right across the street is that Shell station on Harris. Okay, so now we're going to move to a different family, um, the Cronco family. Someone I actually didn't, I didn't know that the Croncos were actually Mexican in the beginning uh, when I was first doing my research, but when I met Maria, she mentioned, oh yeah, the Croncos lived across from my aunt's house in Samoa. I was like, oh, okay. And then after that, that just kind of built on now going down that, that thread, um, right? And um, so you had a uh, Filiberto Cranco, or just Filberto. Um, I've seen both spellings. Um, so here is his World War II draft registration card. Um, it was very hard to try to find pictures of both he and his wife, uh, Cecilia. Um, they both um, got married in uh, Mexico. So different situation, right, from this family. So they were already married, then moved to the States. Um, so immigrated to the U.S. in 1916. He was a laborer, jitney driver, and the night watchman at one point for the Hammond Redwood Company mill in Samoa while she was a homemaker. Uh, they have uh, five children, uh, Linwood, uh, Gabrielle, uh, Robert, Ava, and Helen. And then Hilberto's story is actually pretty interesting, and this is you know, a very similar story um, for, my, I think, a lot, a many uh, Mexican families at this time was, um, like I said, political arrest. So Filberto uh, became a mil mil uh, uh, soldier and a federal officer at the age of 22, following his stint at military school in Mexico City. Um, he was later, uh, he was late in, late in the year of his education when the revolution started over there. Um, he unfortunately participated in the 10, day, 10 tragic days, as they call it, or yeah, uh, which occurred on February 9th, 1913, where there was an attempted coup. Um, this was against his wishes, and after that, then his life and their life was in turmoil, because now he has to go into battle. Um, so he graduated uh, March 11th, 1913, uh, like I said, from the military school with the rank of se second lieutenant of the cavalry, um, and may have been discharged uh, from the gun regiment. Um, and then that's a picture of Pancho Villa in the middle with some other soldiers and I believe some American um, soldiers as well. And I kind of picked this picture. I could have picked any picture um, when uh, later his son uh, does research on this, um, but it just kind of shows some of the military uniforms. So that's why I kind of picked this one. But um, as it showed uh, in the beginning, Filberto and his wife Cecilia, they were both uh, portafristas, which were 
orders of General Porfirio Diaz. Um, and they were also both from the upper middle class while living in Mexico. Um, later, um, he switches sides and he uh, later joins Pancho Villa uh, once he does rebel against the other armies. Because there's a, in that period, there's a lot of this person's on this side and now they're on this side. Now they have a different rebel group and it just was a very tumultuous time. Um, but yes, yeah, so he um, joined Pancho Villa um, at some point um, and then uh, was at the Battle of Celaya um, on April 6th, the 15th, 1915, um, against General Obregón um, Carranza, uh, right, who was the leader of Carranza's forces, forces at that time, um, but was wounded at the city of Leon. Um, and during the withdrawal of the forces to the north, he ends up escaping from that uh, mess and ends up in a hospital. And then he and his wife um, end up fleeing to the US. Um, I haven't been able to get exactly what led from there. Did they go straight through Texas? Did they go straight to California? Um, what was kind of the route before they made it to Humboldt County? And that's still something I'm still researching about. So the one that most people know, and like I said, I didn't know this ahead of time, um, my own ignorance, uh, but Linwood Caranco, or Lynx, as um, sometimes he was called, uh, was born in Samoa uh, in April 1921. He was a local historian and writer. He's written many books on the logging and railroad history in this county um, and has also done work on maritime history. Um, he just kind of was in, had his kind of hands in everything, honestly. Um, but he was also a former teacher at Arcata High School, professor at Humboldt State University and College of the Redwoods. Um, but he was also uh, a past president and board member of the Humboldt County Historic Society. So that's one reason I wanted to include his family in here because that's a nice connection uh, point. And uh, but yeah, there's a picture of him. And then he married uh, Ruth Canham and then they had their sons, Bob and Don, and they lived in Arcata. And then this photo right here is just with one of the descendants or Two of the sense, I can't remember exactly which one, but I believe in the middle is one of the uh, cousins, maybe? I can't remember exactly, but uh, of uh, Pancho Villa. So they're at the house. Um, so this was a family trip down there as he was trying to, towards the end of the, uh, his dad's life, his dad finally told him some of this history. So it was the, his whole life he kept asking and his dad, it was you know, a very hard time for him, so he never said it until the very end. And then from there started contacting the Mexican government and tried to find as many documents as he's had, but at that time, the revolution, they burned most things, so. So yeah, so like I said, very cool connection to the Historical Society in that, yeah, we've had a, a Mexican, uh, you know, past president of the Historical Society, like I said, which I never knew, so. Um, and then, so yeah, so here, uh, I'm gonna show a couple articles um, so we have the census records, we have these family histories, um, but we also have um, this other kind of history um, which comes out in the newspapers, which are, um, I should call them criminals, they could just be people that have done something wrong. Uh, so you had uh, Jose Leva, uh, right? And then he was arrested over in 1918 um, related to furnishing a liquor to Indians. Um, right, and then was made to uh, pay a $50 fine and had uh, 50 days in the county jail. So they give him that deal and he ended up taking it, so. And then here are two other stories. Um, the one on the left, Paz Caranco. So she ended up, um, I believe, stabbing her husband, Cruz, um, in 1931 and she ends up taking a deal where she and her children get deported back to Mexico. Um, and then on the right, um, like I said, another situation of uh, someone committing a murder. So Felipe Hernandez, and then I believe um, the victim was Philip Pines. So, yeah. And if you kind of look through this, I believe it, I don't even think it says there is a woman and they don't actually give her a name. It's just, yeah, exactly, right? But on Summer Street over here in Eureka, so. So like I said, so not everything's always rosy, right? There are a lot of 
stories like that, and I believe one of the first uh, histories I actually have in Del Norte County actually ends up being someone that murdered someone, and that's just what it is, right? And that's, those are the records that come out, right? Those are the things that get documented, and it's kind of the unfortunate history, but it is what it is. Um, and then I kind of really like this kind of little part of history. So these are um, sailors that were on ships and they came through the, the port of Eureka and then they had inspections. So um, this is what the front of their card would have said, alien Siemens identification card. And then here are a couple of the individuals. Um, I just like this because it kind of shows you some of the people's faces, right? Like it's, a lot, it's hard to kind of just see a lot of data and then not have faces. and get that connection. And I also like the, the signatures, and I think that's one reason I like that registration card, is you get the signatures, that's kind of part of who they are. Um, so there's one uh, from Chile. Um, here are it's Manuel later, and... That's a very creative spelling of Chile, I like <laughs> Right, Chile, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a bowl of chili, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's kind of the, like I said, like it's part of the hard part of doing this research is you kind of have to do those misspellings um, from the past and that's how you find people. Um, there's definitely, I think from like 1900 to 1940, somewhere in there there's always one of the decades that gets missing because um, there's a weird spelling from one of the people that was writing all the documents down. So, and that kind of becomes frustrating because then you lose them and then you have to try to pick them up and yeah, and it kind of just, Sometimes you just get them, and sometimes you just lose that thread. Um, and then as we're getting closer to the end, I think. So this name I had already kind of found out, Mini Stork, but um, um, Lynette Mullen actually also talks about her. Uh, so she um, was born in Mexico in January 1871, immigrated here in 1878, um, right? She lived in Hydesville. Um, in 1900, and as I was talking with Lynette, she said that this was the only known listed prostitute in any of the Humboldt County censuses. Um, so that's just kind of an interesting, right? And that's, uh, but in these documents, she's listed as married, had a household, but there's no one else. There's no children documented in, in that household, and there is no husband. So and this is the uh, census record there, and I don't know if you can see, it's towards the bottom, I believe, like the row 70 something way at the bottom. Third from the bottom. Yeah, third from the bottom. Yeah, and that's kind of where she's at, so. And then I put Stark on here because that may actually be her actual name. It just may be a misspelling again. And that's just one of the, this is really one of the few uh, instances that she pops up in any document, and then again, she's, she's gone. Um, so yeah, so like I said, female entrepreneur because um, she did have two children. Um, she's listed in this article of having leased um, John Pedrotti's uh, saloon over in Rio Del um, for a term of five years. And my guess is if she was in the prostitution business, then she also would have had that business as well to kind of help get clients and stuff like that would be my assumption. Um, but I'm sure um, that story will come out if it has more information from Lynette when she writes her book, which will hopefully be soon, as I think everyone else is kind of hoping for that, about the red light districts in Humboldt County. But um, one thing I also liked about her story is just that she is one of the few people that actually listed race black, not white, not mulatto, not just black. So she may have been an Afro-Latina, um, or she just may have been just extremely dark-skinned. And two children, yeah. But the other things to note too is that she was formally educated. She could, she was listed as being able to read and write. So, um, and it's really just 1900. There's this article from 1904, and then that's it. So this very small, not even five-year footprint. Um, so, but this is one I definitely have tried to go down the rabbit hole on, and <laughs> one I will continue to try unless Lynette finds it first. So. Um, but yeah, so, and then, so that's kind of the end um, of what I have for the moment to show you. Um, again, this is just a kind of a snapshot of what we have. There's plenty of other names and other kind of probably stories that I could have went down, but um, these are kind of where I want to go next with this project. Um, I kind of want to better explore the Cal Poly Humboldt uh, students and faculty. Um, that's one thing I've kind of purposely ignored because I feel like I could just 
as a representative and employee of the university, I probably could go to the university and get those records when I'm ready. Um, I know uh, both uh, Linwood and um, Maria uh, Romero were both students from, from then Humboldt State University and graduated there. Um, but yeah, and then the, the other thing I would like to do is once I get all this collated into uh, documents, I want to write at least two articles for the Humboldt story and where I put it, and I want them both to be bilingual, so others that have moved to the area can actually read about this, right? Um, and then also at some point make the database that myself and some of the students have put together with me, uh, make that available for other research tutors to be able to look through. So that's that, and then my acknowledgments, um, like I said, Maria Romero Delaney, hopefully she's on right now, um, like I said, down there in the Bay Area. So um, a lot of good things I got from her as well as, you know, just asking her, like, how was it to be at that time, right? Um, and then uh, these Cal Poly interns and students, um, Rowan, as I mentioned earlier, there's Miguel, David, and India have all kind of pr con uh, participated and contributed in some way to this project. Uh, Deborah Basket was actually who connected me with Maria, so that's why I wanted to give a shout out to her. Um, Carly Marino has been always extremely helpful when you go over there to the Special Collections over at Cal Poly, and Lynette Mullen, because we kind of hashed it out about uh, many a little bit more. Yeah. So yeah, so if you have any further questions, that now would be the time. <laughs> Were their wives with them, or was this a situation where they had come here by themselves and they were left wives either in Mexico or somewhere else in California? Or and you know, um, it's so these are the ones I put on there, and I'd have to go back and double check, which I can easily give you later. But um, I think it was a little bit of both. Some came as younger men or even older men and just came here, um, like happens now, right? You come, then you send money back. but. Um, I think in this time, more so, they would bring the whole family up if that was available. And um, like I said, these are just some of the stories. Like I said, there's, um, like I said, a lot of families that were up here, but um, yeah, a lot of single men as well. Yeah. Hey, this is great. Thank you for doing all that. That's no problem. Yes. You know, if you or, or students or interns uh, have time, have you tried doing anything like, uh, you know, looking at the Humboldt Times on the California Student Journal newspaper mm -hmm. collection online and just on the search term like Mexican or yeah. Chicago? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, um, I have done that. I have done every permutation that you can pretty much think of um, when it comes to that. Mexican, Mexico, Peru, then you got to change that up. Guatemalan. No, yeah, I mean, some of that is just literally up late at night for you get into a research binge of like eight hours of just clicking next on Ancestry. And that's kind of how you find these people because otherwise, um, unless you can have better ways to get through some of those paperwork, it's just, it's just very hard. Um, so yeah, and like I said, it, it worked actually a lot better and quicker to get a lot more of these names once I figured out on Ancestry how to look up nationality or birthplace. That was kind of... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stuff yeah, and then even recently during doing this research, I had originally wanted to go all the way to 1970, but then as census records really only were available up to 1940s and then more recently 1950. So um, you kind of just have to get different routes to get the information. And there was older sites that also had that information um, to get this list. But yeah, definitely California newspaper database, you know, the, um, the one out of UCR, um, both have different values, right? One is better for more recent periods of time, and then the one out of UCR is definitely more of an older newspaper time. Um, and then Ancestry, like I said, a lot. Um, and then as I've been doing research too, I'll end up finding some random name and I'll be like, oh, now I can add that to my research as I do my archeological reports. Yeah. 
I think just the amount of people, honestly. Like I said, I, I came into this and I originally as the had decided to make it more broad and was gonna involve Portuguese into this research because I assumed I wouldn't find many Mexicans or Latinos in general. So I figured I didn't I didn't know. Um, so I had that as a more broader research question and as I've gone on I've kind of shrunk it. Um, I think even at the end, um, was it this list? Yeah. So I did, I did have a couple names of people from Spain, right, that were born in Spain. Yeah, like in China. Um, finding like similar like kind of frequencies of these groups in the other countries that you're studying as well? Humboldt a lot more. Uh, I would say Trinidad's the least amount of people that I'm getting. Um, Del Norte, definitely there are names. Um, and just like in, that I kind of described here, right, um, Juanita Frey, right, she was, uh, mixed uh, Mexican and Hoopa. And those stories are persisting in the other counties as well. You had talked earlier about um, a gap between an individual that you had in the 1700s and what it kind of turned out mm -hmm. through the Cultural Era. Is that because data is limited? No, the data isn't limited, it's just that they're, they aren't here. <laughs> that the, the period before there is really full colonization inhabitation by people that were not native Californians. No, because that was even one of my other aspects and part of my job is coming up, like thinking about where do you find, you know, spaces that show ethnic history, right? So that's part of what we do. We try to find a significance and put it on a listing, right? Um, really, there's only so many spots and there isn't no a, a Mexican hall or a Chilean hall. Um, but as you go on maps, right, you'll see, you know, S Spanish flat, you'll see, you know, different things like that. Um, so it's not surprising, you know. Uh, It would be more in the Catholic, so like I said, St. Bernard's, uh, you know, and like I said, Knights of Columbus, there's probably more in those records. Um, I just haven't gone down the route of uh, looking and talking with the diocese and 